Good morning, folks. I'm out here in the middle of a dirt parking lot. Nobody's around, so I can talk as loudly as I want. Hey, here I am. Three o'clock, a little after three o'clock local time in the morning. And I want to keep my voice down. Of course, those are the first words out of my mouth. And uh, we got a bit to cover today. And I don't know which direction I'm going to go in because, you know, I... I, you could say I make this up as I go, or you could reframe it and say I fly by the seat of my pants. Or you actually might even go as far as to say the guy's got the Holy Spirit and is by the Spirit. Or you can come up with your own classification. I, I need to warn you. Don't believe a thing I say. Question it all. I'm giving you the best information I can. And it requires me to stretch and to think and to delve into old topics that I haven't thought about in, well, longer than some of you folks have been born. So I started this book. I started to read this book yesterday. And I question its validity. But I'm going to tell you that in science, whenever we are testing a hypothesis, whatever we are exploring something, we have to define the limits of knowledge. We have to define, in particular, we have to specify our assumptions. So we assume things are true. Some things are true because we don't have time to prove every bit of it. So we, we choose a foundation, if you will. And when it comes to the uh, hypothetical scientific method, uh, we have what's called a null hypothesis. And so supposedly you can't prove anything, but you can disprove things. Isn't that interesting that you can negate things, you can undermine things, but you cannot affirm or prove things? Well, this is an early artifact from what was developed about four, close to five centuries ago. And there's more to it, and I wish I could remember it and remember the details, but I will tell you this. At the time I was in graduate school, it, these were almost slippery concepts. They were difficult to hold on to. They were not easy to understand. And I know for some people it's like, man, snap the fingers kind of understanding. They understood it. But in my deep thinking, I had to come up with a will. Nobody can disprove the existence of God. Is the scientific method and the, the, the null hypothesis and all that built upon that? And as I'm talking to you, I realize it could be the invert, in the inversion of that, that nobody can prove the existence of God. So we assume that that's there. And I believe that's the way it was in the early days, as we all assumed the existence of God. Today, it's like nobody assumes the existence of God. And I'm going to tell you right now, this book is a book of Jewish supremacism. I'm going to call it that, okay? I need to call it that. Now, there's a fellow who wrote some incredible books, and I bought a cup. I have one of his books. I have another one featured as a free PDF on my website. And I think he wrote very well, and I think he was quite right. But I just pulled up a web page yesterday indicating he was vilified by the Southern Poverty Law Center. He was vilified as a white supremacist. And I'm thinking, okay, what's the difference between being a white supremacist and being a Jewish supremacist? I mean, they're both supremacists, right? They're both sticking their heads up like they're kings over everybody else and they know it all, right? That's the problem I have. That's the problem I have with this. Now, Charles Weissman, they actually listed him under his pen name from what I can tell. I don't know what his real name was. I wish I had time and I had the money to burn because I put it in my fuel tank and I go up to Michigan and I interview my older, my big brothers and sisters up there that know more than I do and I get the answers to my questions. 
So I want to know what Charles Weissman's real name was. That's part of it. And uh, I think that's a proper picture on the, of him on the Southern Poverty Law Center. It, it, it looks familiar. He's a fellow, I don't know, he's, he's uh, kind of thin, a white dude in a suit, uh, dressed conservatively, dressed at a higher level than what we dress today. I'm not here to prove Charles Weissman's work or disprove it. I think his books stand on their own. I do know that his books are now in the public domain, that his family did not regard their son, their brother. They didn't regard him very highly. And when he passed away, the word is that they hauled cartons of brand new, fresh books, brand new books out to the dump and tossed them away. When I heard that story, I realized the family has thrown away its copyrights. The copyrights are good for 150 years. I believe that's 150 years after the death of the author, or that could be 150 years from the time of publication. I don't know if that would be from the time of inception or the time of actually going to print, because those are two separate dates that are issued on these books. But I know this, the family could have sold those books. It probably would have taken some time because there's not many people that believe in this way. And there's never going to be many people that believe in this way. As a matter of fact, I went forward at a Billy Graham concert. It was only decades later I was informed that Billy Graham turned his back upon the way. He didn't preach the truth that he knew that was in the Bible. And he was said to have admitted this. And he ended up preaching to tens of thousands, huge stadiums of people. And of course, that meant the bucks come in. So Billy Graham was a, a sellout. Very disappointing for me because at 15 years of age in Kansas City, I went forward. I remember it as it was an extremely emotional time for me. So Billy Graham knew the truth about the Israelites and he turned his back on it and as a result they lifted his ass up so he is one of the lying pastors that Isaiah prophesied about a long time ago I'm sorry to say that and I did go to one church and I joined one church and it was famous because Billy Graham's son was a uh, he was commissioned there, so to speak. I guess it was anointed or, or whatever you want to call it, but it was at that particular church in, uh, in Tempe, Arizona. So I did join that church formally, and I was a member of it, and I was in the Sunday school classes regularly, and somehow or other, maybe it was because I was a psychologist, or maybe it was because of the neighborhood I lived in, or maybe both, I ended up getting to hang out with some pretty wealthy people who were accomplished, who had very good lives and good families. And uh, it was wonderful to be around them. I didn't, they didn't always have it right because they would pull from the Bible, especially the women, to justify whatever it is they wanted to justify. Now, this gentleman here, in God's day of judgment, he pulls from the Bible and I can make a claim it's the way he wants. And so as you can see, I haven't read hardly a damn thing there. And what he does is he tells you that he, he tells you this. He tells you several things. These are assumptions of his. He doesn't clarify these. This is not a scientific book, hardly at all. He, he does not clarify this, but he says the Hebrews became the Jews. Well, Hebrews and Jews rhyme, and that's about the gist of it right there, because they aren't the same people. I don't give a damn what this Jewish gentleman says, and actually he may have the right judgment day. He may have stumbled on it, like the blind sow, even the blind sow occasionally gets an acorn. He may be right about this judgment day.
So the first assumption he gives us is that the Hebrews became the Jews, and that is not true. And I will give you one proof of that. The Jews say that their lineage is inherited through your mothers. In other words, it's a matriarchy. The Jewish culture, I don't know if I want to call it a political movement, a religion, freaking race or what. You, you can define it whichever way you want. But I'm going to tell you this. They say it's a matriarchy. You get your Jewishness from your mother. Okay. What's wrong with that? Well, when we go to the Bible, we read about patriarchies. That's all we read about. Well, pretty much all we read about. Women are hardly mentioned. And the line, the birthright, and all of that, the mother is really important. Please don't get me wrong. Don't think I'm belittling the position of women because I think women are pretty much all powerful. It's what it looked like when I was a little boy and as I get older it's the same shit. The Israelites had a definite patriarchy. The line followed the fathers. It didn't follow the mothers. So that is just part of it. Now we can go a lot further than that but that's the one it's a simple proof. So let's just accept it as what it is. The Hebrews were a patriarchy. The modern Jews, which is a whole new religion, a very new one in my book, is a matriarchy. Okay. The Jewish religion as I see it today is not the newest religion on the planet, but about the second newest religion on the planet for the organized religions. The newest religion on the planet is Sikhism, and that was synthesized in the 1700s, in the 18th century. And it's a, it's a fabulous, fantastic religion in some sense. It's not too bad. And the Sikhs produce some incredible warriors. And they also have values. And I don't know how well they live up to them, and they have a tradition and they have their stories and the, the newer younger folks don't believe in those it's a lot like it is with churchianity they don't really believe those old stories and this fellow's telling you this is the second assumption he's telling you is the bible was made up by a previous civilization and it's not true it's all code the Bible, we're, let me qualify this, I'm sorry. The first five books, the Torah, which I believe we call the books of the law, which I believe that when we got a king, King Saul, I believe the king was required to read the book of the law every day. So he would be able to know God's will, he would be able to know the law we agreed to at Mount Sinai, and he would be able to lead these people. Same with David. David... David meditated upon it. He said he meditated upon it day and night. And that's kind of the model I espouse to. I mean, rather than thinking about the BS I think about, I'd rather be thinking about those higher standards and higher values. Now, I'm going to interject here and tell you that when Solon, the father of the Greek philosophy, was down in Egypt, he was, he was being schooled by one of the sages that had survived the last earth age. So this teacher told Solon that the civilization that existed before was much greater and it was noted for its laws. It had better laws than what we have. They were far superior to anything else. So that's just a little word for you that you need to hear. So his assumption is, well, what he does is he takes and he takes numbers, puts numbers to these five books, and he comes up with different schemes, different patterns, different formulas to prove what he wants to prove. It's not very scientific. It's little on the hocus pocus side it leans towards numerology it leans towards those things which I believe we're told not to do 
Now, I know that some people talk about the gospel in the sky. And of course, we have the zodiac and we have horoscopes and we have mediums and we're told not to turn to mediums or channelers. And of course, here you are on Dr. Kent's channel. So I get to channel something to you, which kind of puts me in a bind because I don't want to be challenging one of these evil spirits, which is what you're living through right now. Those old spirits ain't gone anywhere. It's a conceptualization. It's a perspective pretty much given, given to us from the Bible. I believe it has validity. Where do I draw the line between the gospel in the sky and the zodiac and astrology and all those mediums and soothsayers? It's a hard one to draw because a lot of that stuff was in our tradition until the Emperor Constantine, great, great, great grandson of Herod the Great, an Edomian, an Edomite, before he rewrote things and got rid of a lot of traditions that were part of our early faith. He did that because his wife was from the streets and she did bad stuff to her guests in the dungeon of the castle and he didn't want her suffering instant karma if you will he didn't want her suffering in the future if you will and he may have removed some of the concepts of of uh, reincarnation as well i don't think that was part of our tradition i disagree with that yet i do have one memory and and that was from childhood, and it was a horrible dream. Actually, I had several dreams that weren't too good, including of the coming deluge. As a little boy, I was rattled with that every damn night, and I did not like it. So the sad thing is that in my dream, I was, I was dying in that. I was disappearing in that flood of mud, volcanic earth, everything. Just everything was a mess. And I disappeared in that tsunami or the tidal wave or that, you know, my sense of self just went away. And I was a little boy of about, when I was seven years old when I had the bulk of those dreams and I believe I had some of those at age six. He takes the Bible and says it's code. It's not true. And one of the first examples he gives you is when it says that Moses put to death, killed 3,000 Israelites were killed that day. That's as a result of the golden calf worship. Remember, he's up on the mountain for too long, and then he comes down, and they're all, well, I think they were having a very... Uh, I'm going to guess it was a very orgiastic kind of a time. I think they had gone totally wild. They were doing all kinds of sins under the guise of worshiping this golden calf because this calf gave them the power to do all this ugly stuff. I'm going to guess that's what Moses saw because he was pretty angry about it. But 3,000 men were put to death. It's a nice round number. He says that's not the case. He says that that's part of of the code or the clue to tell you that this is a book of code. You have to decipher the code to get to the meaning. And he claims that the entire Bible points to the end of the earth age. This coming end of the earth age, which we are very close to. I wanted to get the book to read it to see whether or not he was right or whether or not he was wrong because he claims that the date of that is October 16th, 2046. October 16th, his claim on this video on YouTube is that that's because that's the anniversary of the date the floodgates opened in the heavens for Noah's flood. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't regard Noah's flood as occurring 12,000 years ago. I regard Noah's flood as occurring more like 6,000 years ago. So right there, we can undermine and challenge this, this theory he's put forward. Okay. That's my thinking. But let me take it a couple steps further. 
the oldest book in the Bible isn't the Torah. The oldest book in the Bible is the book of Job. And it's a very important book because it tells us a lot of things. It actually tells us, in my opinion, and this is from my interpretation, about the belly band of water at the Earth's equator and how that snake comes to life. It's, it's in the ocean. I should be opening the Bible up and reading this. I did put on enough light so I can actually do that. Wonderful thing about this this coach compared to my last one. I have an, I have twice as many batteries. The guys didn't put the right batteries in. They cheated me there too. And I have an inverter, which allows me to take that DC current that's stored in the batteries. And I've got these 110, you can see it right there. That's a 110 volt light. So I've got alternating current but I'm just below 12 volts. I don't like going below 12 because from my experience, I kill batteries <laughs> and I don't want to kill these batteries, but I have to get the right batteries in here sometime and they aren't cheap. It's going to be another grand at today's prices. Who knows what it'll be at tomorrow's prices. And I just came off the mountain somewhat figuratively, but literally and uh, I was in training on mo this motorhome and other motorhomes, and it was overwhelming. And my training got cut short, so my teacher crammed it in there, and he was pretty hard on me. He's an old-fashioned kind of guy. <clears throat> I know you think I'm old. He's about eight years older than I am, and he's he does he knows this stuff so well. He pointed out <clears throat> the very poor work that I've had done recently. And he also pointed out the poor work that was done when they built this thing from the get-go. <clears throat> An amazing man with incredible skills, uh, incredible house, incredible... He's, he's got... He does so much on his own. And I don't do that. I'm, I'm kind of a book guy. I'm kind of a tent dweller, if you will. And the dog, she's out here sleeping. We've both been sleeping since we got down off that mountain pretty much at once I fueled up and parked. We've been sleeping nonstop, so we've had hours of rest. But that 8,000 foot elevation really did get to me. The book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. I believe it was written during the previous Earth Age meaning it was written more than 12,000 years ago. This guy is right about the length of age for the Earth, most likely, 12,068 years. And I can pull up a, a decent copy of the Apocrypha, and I can back that biblically. I will do that at some point, but not this time. I also think there's another book that we have to point to very strongly. You see, Yahshua, when he was here, from what I can tell, and I think we've got three Gospels, so we've got some pretty good witnesses on this. He said that as it was in the day of Noah, but he also said as it was in jo the days of Jonah. I believe that's references in the Bible. I could be wrong about that, so please correct me if I am. But he said, as it is in the days of Noah, the wickedness would be like that. And if you look at it, they were giving each other in, in marriage. They were doing some weird marriages back then. What do we have going today? Well, we've exceeded the limits of the definition of a marriage. The, the legal definition for a marriage was a union between a man and a woman until just recently when we decided to go woke and change that. But I believe the book of Jonah is important because Yahweh, Yah, sent his son, and Yahshua, his son who he sacrificed, who he was in the flesh, this, this is mysterious stuff. And I, I hold it gently because it still overwhelms me to this day. Was in the ground for three days, three nights, approximately. And Jonah was in the belly of the whale or 
a fish or some people think a U-boat. <laughs> uh, seriously, folks, we're very flexible here. We're brainstorming. Was in the belly of that beast, if you will, just like Yahweh, Yeshua was in the belly of the earth. It's symbolic. But yet we're pointed to that time, to that book, by this, because it's parallel history, if you will. It's a similar event. If we go to the book of Jonah, what lesson do we learn? A very important lesson is that Yahweh himself has the capacity and the characteristic. He's a, he has the capacity to repent. And it says in there that Yahweh repented of the evil he had planned for the city of Nineveh. So that what I'm getting at is Yahweh can change his mind. Yahweh has a general inclination and a course. But my sense is that we may have a different kind of end of the earth age. And I hope so. And I'm going to tell you my rough, raw thinking, which I think is really pretty basic, is that when we return to Yahweh when we repent of our ways and ask him to help us do his ways when we repent of our limitations of our physical animal appetites and satisfying those and, and live at a higher level namely according to the Ten Commandments the law of life is what I prefer to call them that Yahweh repents of the evil Yahweh actually might come running to greet us like that, well, like the father did when his, oh, I'm having a block because I guess I was one of those, one of those sons, but that son that went living a, a fast lifestyle came running back. The father ran to greet him. This to me is another story, if you will, depicting that you know, when we return to Yahweh, Yahweh runs to us. And I have to be honest with you. I think that in the early days, I think that the stories I heard about Yahweh being in the back of the ranks of the Israelites in the army, the militia, and that when they went to fight, that um, he would go to break through the ranks, charge up. He was there first. Killed about 85% of the enemy, left 15% for the Israelites to mop up and clean up. That's one of the quaint stories I've heard. I probably shouldn't repeat it. It doesn't really sound very true in many ways. But the important thing is that Yahweh fights for us. And how do we know that? Well... We don't, but we do have in the Bible, and I'm still going by it as a book of truth. And I believe it was written by Israelites for Israelites. And I believe that's a peculiar people. But as far as salvation, I don't have it down pat. As far as the blessing, because we are supposed to be a blessing to all peoples. That's the way I read it. Nations, ethnos, peoples. You can say races even if you want, or cultures. It's okay to think that way here. We're supposed to be a blessing to all of them. How do we do that? Well, at this point in time, <clears throat> we've race mixed, and we're doing that according to the, uh, the Calgary plan who was a half Oriental, half European gentleman, who decided, and I believe, he was, I believe he was Jewish or maybe Edomite. See, that's the problem, is that we don't understand the nature of the Jews. And Charles Weissman has a book on it, and I'd love to get it. Um, I'd really love to get a hardback, and in hardback, but a paperback copy of it. His books have gotten very rare. Um, 
if anybody knows of a PDF file of that that they could share with me, that would be very helpful because he writes very well. I would I would read it in a weekend at the most. <clears throat> so here we are. We're stuck polarized. We're being, well, the rest of the world, the other nations, the other ethnos, the other races, the other cultures are being told that we are white supremacists and we want to kill them or rule them or lord it over them. I don't look at it that way. And I could be wrong about this, but I really think from my reading is that we're chosen servants. We're the servant race. That's the way I look at it. And I don't think the Jews are supposed to lead us, lord it over us, or be our masters. I just don't believe that. Um, I don't trust their traditions. I don't trust their, their uh, the Talmud, the various Talmuds. I don't trust those at all. Uh, I think that we have the truth delineated in the Bible. Yes, it is code. Is it a numeric code? I, I don't think so. I think it's more allegory, simile than that. Maybe it's literal, but maybe it's literal and that yet there's stories there on top of it or within it, other stories to be told. And I've always wondered, why is this story at the end about the fallen angels at the end of the book? Now I can answer that. It's because it's the end of the earth age. And that's what's being described. The stars, one third of the stars are cast to the earth along with Satan. <clears throat> Yet this fellow, Mr. Vaught, I, th I hope I'm saying his name right. His first name is also John. No, it's Douglas. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, I'm glad I read that. Douglas B. Vaught. V-O-G-T. Vote, vote. Douglas B. Vote or Vaught. Or Vajit. <laughs> you tell me how to say it. I know that the Japanese would pronounce every letter in that. Okay. His claim to me doesn't hold much water and he undermines himself because even in the appendix, which is a nice appendix, by the way, this is a nice, nicely done book. I'm not going to return it even if I disagree with him. I, I'm going to stay with this book. It's going to take a long time to digest all of this. Uh, he's done a wonderful job. There are fallacies in it. Uh, the number one fallacy is the Hebrews did not become the Jews. That is the great deception that occurred probably around the 1600s, 1700s. A lot of bad things happened then. I know the King James Bible was written, and I know a lot of you think that King James must have been a saint. <laughs> no, he was not a saint. Um, Charles Dickens wrote four pages about his character in one of his books. I'd love to see that someday. Uh, one of my older brothers told me he had the book and he wished he still had it. But apparently uh, King James was a really wicked dude. And so there could be some truth that the Bible was given in particular to control the masses. Well, Yahweh wants to control life on the earth. He wants us living by the Ten Commandments. Those are the laws of life. Those are the precepts that if you live by, you're liable to be able to live a little bit longer than if you violate those. My hope is that we can repent to a large enough degree here on the planet that Yahweh has some mercy during this next Nova. I know some people want to call it a micro Nova and I called it that for a bit as well. So, if there's a difference between a micronova and a nova, I don't know what it is, but Mr. Vada assures us that there's no difference. This is in novas, the sun novas, that's all there is to it. How does the sun nova? Apparently, it gathers dust as we go through this part, this neck of the woods. 
to this part of the clock, to this part of the universe. When we go through this particular zone, there's more dust, space dust, which also may be conceptualized as, as gamma radiation. And he actually has got, I didn't study it, but he's got what, the, what it consists of in here. So he's got that scientific stuff in here. And so the, the sun collects that stuff. It, it, gets, it irritates the sun. It kind of bombards the surface. And it sounds like it forms like a shellac coating on the sun. And the sun blows the coating off. And that's when we get recycled. That's when the, that's God's day of judgment. Um... Now, from another psychologist, I don't know the guy's name. I've only seen this, this on YouTube once. He's a peculiar fellow. He likes to wear a uh, Renaissance-style cap, uh, trying to indicate, well, it's part of his trademark, if you will, and I believe he earns a living by speaking at conventions. Uh, he's got a massive amount of language, language of, of knowledge, so he goes there and he just lectures on his stuff, and he gets paid. Look, I've had a few gifts given to me in the past. That was nice. I prefer to earn my way. If you don't mind, buy one of my Bibles. Um, they make good gifts as well. I think I've got the best, the latest, and the greatest Bible available. This is the proper name version of the King James Bible. <clears throat> and by the way, I know people say that you don't want a copyrighted Bible. Well, the King James Bible is copyrighted <clears throat> everywhere else in the world except for in America. Why? Because of our Revolutionary War. Somehow or other, we ended up with the King James Bible and we don't recognize the crown's rights to it. But when it came time to produce this version, the publisher told me he had to negotiate to get the rights, to get permission from the crown of England to be able to do this work. And the, they were dictating to him what they wanted him to do. And he wanted to take out the these and the thous and go to modern English. And, and there was, that's basically the gist of it. And so for five years, they refused to give him permission to copy this. So the sad thing is that every time you buy this, there's a little bit of money that goes over to the crown, which I don't I don't like very much. But that was accomplished so that this Bible could be sold throughout the entire world because it would be in violation outside of America today. Now, we have managed to <clears throat> produce this in electronic form and put it up on the Internet freely. Um, I was taken back when that happened. Uh, the rationalization was that... Uh, the shipping cost exceeded the cost of the Bible to Africa in particular. Now, how much the people in Africa are going to take up, take us up on this, I just don't know. Um, my belief is that you read the Bible for yourself, and you have to find yourself in it, and you have to find your own salvation in it as well. Um, this helps us avoid... The questions of race exclusivity and not sharing it because I believe according to the way I read the Bible that every knee shall bow and everyone shall know the name of Yahweh so nobody's gonna say no Yahweh anymore that's gonna be done so I think that day is coming and it's like who am I to tell somebody they shouldn't exist who am I to tell somebody you can't read my Bible who am I to tell them that you can't abide by the Ten Commandments. Now that is foolishness to me because I want everybody understanding those rules of engagement, if you will, those rules. I think those are important and good rules. I think we want to applaud everyone when they abide by the Ten Commandments and they live at a higher level. Especially when they're honest about you, they back their work, they back their word. They don't lie to you. They, they don't deceive. And they're kind to you.
So, oh, I got to do a bunch of house cleaning. It's pretty much a mess in here. Yes, please do buy one of my Bibles. I want to travel the country, which means I burn my money because I have to use that money, that medium of exchange, currency of the realm, and then I buy fuel with it, put it in my tank, and I go down the road and I burn it. So, and it takes a bit to fuel this baby. And this is one of the more efficient coaches ever made. Uh, this is this is the old uh, C12 um, for pollution controls, and it has a lot of power, and power translates into miles per gallon. So it's more efficient. A modern coach like this, you can expect to get maybe seven miles to the gallon. This, the guys try to claim they get seven to a, 10 to 11 miles to the gallon out of it, but I don't think so. Um, I'm, I'm hoping for nine. 10 would be just wonderful. Um, it's a lot better than seven. And in case you're wondering, the, the diesel technology has advanced. There's a new diesel head that allows them to extract 20 times the energy out of the diesel, which means that these trucks that are on the road at 80,000 pounds getting three miles to the gallon, you multiply that by 20. If we put the new modern heads on those engines, we would, they would be getting 60 miles to the gallon. And now I just want you to imagine for a second, how much cheaper would everything be if you were getting 60 miles to the gallon delivery? In other words, the cost of transportation, one aspect of it, the fuel dropped by to 1 20th of what it is today. That would drop prices across the board for everybody. That is a tide which rises all boats. All ships rise on that tide. So I think we should treat the truckers better. And I think we should allow the modern technology to be used. That technology was developed probably a long, long time ago, but I read about it five years ago. And it basically is a, it's a, the equivalence of running a Bunsen burner, which is a blue flame, which means you're getting all of the energy out of that long molecule. You're getting all the energy and you don't have to have pollution controls because you're eating it up. You're, 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 you're transitioning it into energy. You don't have much pollution on those. You don't need any systems on that. Well, do I recommend you get God's Day of Judgment um, if you want to read it? If you, it's a lot to read, a lot to stick to. Um, you can listen to me. And I'll try to explain things and put limits on, on my conceptualizations as best I can so that you will understand where the mistakes could be and you know where the limits are so that you could actually sort it out further. Look, I, I just can't help but imagine there might be some, well, I'll call him a youngster, but you know, everybody's younger than I am. But some youngster out there is going to be able to take this stuff and go with it much further than I have gone with it. I believe that's my mission, is to reach out to that young young man and to, uh, to somehow give him the training he needs so that he can do far greater than what I do. That's what I believe is my mission. I, uh, I had a vision, a dream to that effect a while back. And uh, I mean, it was, it's my privilege to be able to talk with you. And I, I thank you so much for, for hanging out with me because you know, these are not easy subjects, uh, and you've got a lot of things you need to attend to these days, and it takes time to get into this stuff, and time to understand it, but yet, I am finding people quoting the Bible all the way around me. I, it, unfortunately, it tends to be the churchianity type quote, the, the Zionist Christian type inspiration, um, which doesn't get them very far. You have to read the Bible for yourself. Of course, if you're here on my channel, you're already probably already read the Bible. You may know it better than I know it, and you're just hanging out here to hear what else there might be that you can discover. I don't know. Why do you tune in to me? 
You know, I've heard some people say you enjoy it quite a bit. Well, okay, fine. I'm not really trying to be that entertaining. I'm trying to warn you. I'm trying to get you prepped up. And I'm trying to let you know that this country of ours has been taken down. It's not here anymore. I mean, we, when I was a little boy, things were more obvious to me. I, I wasn't so brainwashed by the prevailing culture. And one of the things that did not make sense is I thought I was an American. What do you mean I'm a United States citizen? Well, the truth is I am an American and I'm not a citizen of the United States. A citizen of the United States is a 14th Amendment citizen created by a United States congressman as only three-tenths of a man, by the way. So what I'm getting at is that America is different than the United States. We have made, made them equivalents, just like calling Hebrews Jews. It's not the same. Yes, it rhymes. And when we say the United States of America, incorporating the word America in there, that is not the same as being an American. And Americans are under the Constitution, which means you are a citizen of your state. So when I filled out my recent passport, I told the truth. And they're trying to get me to just send in a simple renewal. I said, I can't do that. My information has changed, and I'm not going to lie, because on previous applications, I lied without knowing it, because I believe they're big lies. So I'm a, I'm a citizen of Alaska, born in the free state of New Hampshire, and you need to start considering yourself a citizen of your state, and under the Republic and under constitutional law with rights, not privileges. You do need to ignore the central federal government. It is bankrupt and it should go bankrupt. It actually has so much in assets that maybe I'm wrong, but the only way to find out is to bankrupt her. And my thinking is we need to get all the assets declared it's going to take a long time to declare all of those assets, and we need to figure out who has what coming to them. It's not going to be easy. It's going to take some. It's going to take a lot of expertise. I hope the attorneys don't rip us off like they have in the past. Actually, the attorneys aren't allowed to. Uh, they aren't even. They're, they're stripped of their citizenship under, under the original Thirteenth Amendment. The the real Thirteenth Amendment, the real law of the land. The attorneys are stripped of any and all citizenship, and they're not allowed to have any positions at which um, award them any kind of wages or living. That's the Thirteenth Amendment. Why is it in place? It's there in place because the attorneys got us into the War of 1812. Why did the attorneys do that? They're beholden to the king, to the British crown, British accreditation regency. The king rules over America through his bar associations. And that's why we've got those liars and thieves predating upon the rest of us. Plus, they provide a buffer zone and protect the genocidists at the top of the food chain. I used to wonder years ago, what's with those people? They do a communist purge and they kill all their intelligentsia. Anybody wearing glasses gets killed. And any physician gets killed, too. That's insane. Why do they do that? Well, you need to understand that sometimes the people have got a good gut sense. And a good gut sense would tell you that those guys aren't out for your best interests. That they're lying to you. That they're poisoning you. That they're hiding, they're hiding the poisoning of you. They are covering up the management of the plantation, whereby they decide, ah, let's get rid of some human beings. We really can't afford to feed their mouths. I'd like to have a new yacht, so we'll just kill off that particular country there, and we'll take their resources, and I'll get my new yacht. Folks, I believe if a man earns his way and earns properly, he should be able to have a yacht. Okay, fine. You 
could say I have a land yacht right here. I mean, this is a little bit bigger than your average motorhome, but the same reason this lifestyle is dying is why America is dying. Because people aren't honest, they aren't kind to one another, they aren't trustworthy. You cannot get good work done anymore. Don't buy one of these unless you're going to work on it yourself. And you can't do everything on it yourself. So just be prepared. And likewise, realize that the year 2046 is not that far away. You know, if I live, I'll be in my, jeez, I'll be in my 90s then. If I'm alive for this. And some of you are going to be around for it. You're going to be seeing this or you're going to get your life cut short and whatever happens beforehand because we don't know what the earth changes will be like leading up to this. And of course, it's, he puts on it the, the real cause of global warming, which I don't think he addresses one iota in here because, well, maybe he does. We'll find out because Pluto is heating up as well and there ain't no SUVs on Pluto, baby. I don't even think they got oil on Pluto. <clears throat> This worshiping the green movement is the green horse in the book of Revelations, whereby the world is conquered through the communist backdoor environmentalism. And I know, I know, I got a buddy out there who says, green's a symbol for the Muslims. And I'm going to tell you, Muslim, Muslims, there's nothing wrong with them. They're the other side of the family, man. They're the descendants of, you know, from Hagar's son, Ishmael. So, they got blessed too, did they not? I mean, the blessing when it was given, I, maybe it's just to that one side of the family. I don't know. Maybe you read it that way. But the way I read it is there were 12 dukes and there were 12 boys. What the heck? Each one's got 12. Isn't that amazing? And the 12 dukes are mentioned before the 12 boys that founded the 12 tribes. And of course, we all know those 13 tribes he doesn't know it is it important to know which tribe you came from it's about as important I think at this point to know which race you're from I know I know I'm going to offend my white supremacist brothers and sisters okay I'm going to tell you right now we are made up of the DNA of the previous species on the planet and if you can tell me how much Cro-Magnon, Denison, Neanderthal you got in you, then you're way ahead of me. And I'm going to tell you, most of the Neanderthal, by the way, from what I can tell, the Asiatics got a hold of that. The Chinese in particular got a hold of that. That's why they're bigger than the rest over there. And that's why they, they're formidable soldiers. They're about the same size of, as our guys are. You need to understand, it is mixed up right now. We have we have procreated in a manner against the law of life. And then I know a lot of people don't want to hear that adultery means watering down something. Well, it does mean that diluting your genes is part of that in my book. But that's not what the great, great sin of miscegenation is. I don't think it's a good thing. I don't encourage it. But I don't think that's the real problem. I think that's a pointing to the real problem, which is that humans decided they wanted to mate with fallen angels, to have greater offspring, to have more power, to better their lives. So I think the pastime back then, probably for the women was, which one of these fallen angels can I seduce so I can have the better offspring? Now, we also know that the fallen angels went into the women took them for wives so we don't know how voluntary it really was you know they could have just been forcing themselves on these women the women might have been able to realize I can't have this 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 guy's baby it'll kill me it'll be too big I don't have a lot of answers I have a lot of questions you tune back in this is just the beginning of God's day of judgment I believe that we can unite the world. And what we should unite upon is the fact that we are all facing this together. There's no escaping this. And we need to, we need to talk about it. And we need to prepare for it. 
And part of that preparation is going to be getting fuel together. You're going to have oil to be able to heat yourself through this transition period. You're not going to be able to do it with, with uh, solar panels when the sun blows like that. Solar panels will get wiped out very easily. We're going to be humbled as an entire planet. And we that call ourselves human beings today, and it's a grand family with a lot of different species in it, we have to realize that we're in this boat all together. And we want the earth to come through as best it can come through. And we want our children to survive. And we would like it if Yahweh might be a little softer this time. Instead of sending us hellfire and damnation, so to speak, as that shellac shell bursts off the sun. Oh, you know, it, remember in the end of the Bible, or in the Bible, where it talks about the earth appeared as in sackcloth. Well... It's going to be the sunspots. It's going to be all sunspots. So it's going to look like it's in sackcloth. That's what that's referring to. And in case you're wondering, it also alludes to the fact that it appears mammals in particular are going to be affected. Anything, anyone above ground is going to go blind during that particular period. So you have to be aware of that. I'm trying to warn you in advance. Now, as I read it, there's six different days of the Lord in the Bible. This guy is just pointing to one. Don't ask me to spout off the six off the top of my head. But I think there are more days of the Lord in this Bible documented. And I think they're going to be coming to us than just this one. Although this is the big one. This is where everything gets reset. And we get blown back to the Stone Ages possibly. However... The evil ones have been on the planet for about six Earth Ages. They know what's coming. They've survived it before. They've dug in before. And they've come out on top every time. But this time they screwed up. Because they turned a president to Tricky Dick. To pass a blessing on them so they could have a breakaway society. And they have a breakaway society and they did not consult with the rest of humanity, and they did not have the information, and they built all those underground cities and all that other stuff, that the magnificent stuff that they've wasted our substance on. That's right. That's where most of our substance has gone, in, the, in, a, in a hole in the earth, in a, in a pit in the earth. Or a, they built them in the wrong locations. They are going to get wiped out as well. Some may make it, but the people that will be surviving on the planet will recognize them for what they are and will be hunting them down. And by the way, it's not going to be instant. It's going to take, it's going to take several generations to hunt those bastards down because some of them are going to come out at different times. They're going to be in at different depths. So we have got a lot that we're dealing with. And I just do not believe that the Jews... God's chosen people. Do I believe the Israelites are God's chosen people? Well, I think we might be chosen to be the servants and to bless the rest of, the, of mankind. But here's the problem. There's only two warring factions. And right now it comes down to the Edomites. The Edomites who are hiding behind these guys to a certain extent and some other enclaves and groups against Adam kind. Why Adam kind? Because we get the closest up to their level of intelligence. We have the best shot of revealing them to the rest of humanity. We have the best opportunity to catch them and expose them for what they are. And they are going to genocide these other races as well. They're just gonna take us out first. And they've done a good job so far. They've hidden themselves. I'm going to close on this. I've probably gone too far, and I hope I haven't said anything untoward. I really want to see the planet united. I think we can unite based upon the Ten Commandments, which I will call the law of life, because there are other 
belief systems out there, and I think that they would agree on the law of life. They don't want to be under the Bible, but yet they will be under the law of life, the most important part of the Bible. We all are under that anyway, but Yahweh's only going to put up... I, I said something in the middle of Nebraska to a stranger, this woman, and I guess she could see my pain, and I was old, she wasn't a young woman, she was middle-aged, older middle-aged, and I, I just told, I just lamented about how things were going, and, and she said, uh, she assured me that, you know, Yahweh's only going to tolerate evil for so long, there's a limit to it, well, there is a limit to it. I've been a man who most of my life has pressed the limits, searched the limits. That's what that's one limit. I didn't I'm glad I got out of it. I don't want to press it. I don't want to search it. But these other folks are searching it and pressing it as far as they can. And I know you're going to say, well, they don't believe Satan is real, but they sure act like it. And they're making all those sacrifices. They'll sacrifice entire civilizations to Satan. They'll sacrifice their own children. They'll sacrifice other people gladly. You don't think so? I just saw a video of Elon Musk earlier this yesterday. I had heard about it. He lost his son to the woke agenda. That's why he's motivated to go against it now. I still don't trust the man all that much. I don't like his cars that much. I don't like his battery technology that much. I really don't want to see cobalt in those batteries. I'm afraid of what happens when they get irradiated. But I think Elon Musk probably knows more about the Earth than most of us do since he's popping rockets off it pretty often and bringing them back down, which is quite a feat. I don't know who he hires but he hires the right people. I think the Tesla is a fast car, but I don't think that it's a savior at all. As a matter of fact, I think we should never have um, subsidized those one bit, and we shouldn't subsidize those at all. Because if this earth is headed for God's day of judgment, then what difference does it make? You know? I think we need to give the little guy out there cheap energy, affordable energy, and not dictate technologies to them that make it dirtier or that shorten the lives of, of the engines and products and make them harder to maintain. I think the evil ones have got us by the throat. They've got a stranglehold on us, and they have just about killed this nation. They've, about killed, they've killed our industry so that we cannot wage war and we can't defend ourselves, and yet those bastards are still in the seats of power you know, those are the handlers, those are the ones around the thrones all over the world, and they're still putting us at each other so they can come out on top. Let's, let's reveal them for what they are. Let's reveal them for the Satans they are. They are devils. They're not kind. They want to kill off a bunch of us, and they want to rule the rest, whatever's left. May Yahweh bless.